Hello, Trek friends. As we settle into the top 50 best episodes of all time in live action Star Trek, our block today contains several with line deliveries that help cement these episodes in the best of the best. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Dustin Wing. <laughs> Being absolved of genocide at 52 and 53, Shenanigans Gone Wild, or Shockwave Parts 1 and 2. I've seen some say this is the worst two-parter in all of Trek, and I'm not quite sure how. It has balanced action with drama and furthering recurring series plots. The episode starts with the crew of Enterprise thinking they accidentally set an atmosphere on fire and unalived over 3,600 people. Except for the sound of Archer throwing his water polo ball against the bulkhead, the return voyage to Earth is silent, with the fate of human spaceflight hanging in the balance. Johnny's guardian angel, Daniels, gives him some Cold War secrets to prove the Sulaban set them up. That brings back their old friend Silic to retrieve the data disks and take Enterprise prisoner when it appears Archer didn't turn himself over. But a time travel experiment gone wrong leaves Jonathan Archer stuck in a future that is not his own. And neither is it Daniel's. This round of time shenanigans finds them the only living souls on a dead future Earth, where Daniel's techno-babble MacGyver's a crank-prank time phone to let T'Pol know a plan for Archer to make them leap home by tricking Silic into using future tech and in the process Beebs, which does manage to get him back from the fallout future. Bringing the Borg and Federation closer together at 50 and 51, deal with the devil. Or Scorpion Parts 1 and 2. After being intrigued by a power greater than the Borg in the opening teaser, we get the first appearance of John Rhys Davies as Da Vinci on the holodeck, which is the setting Kathy uses to process the reality that Voyager is finally in Borg space and they've got to think very carefully about how to proceed. It appears from scans that there's a convenient passage devoid of the Borg, but what they find down that blind alley is something worse that the Borg stirred up from something called fluidic space. Species 8472 is now bent on purging the entire galaxy of life, which leads Janeway to make a truce to fight their common enemy with the Borg. A truce which Chakotay breaks when Kathy's incapacitated and leaves him in the doghouse. The end of the first episode leaves Harry Kim suffering again, though the 8472 bioweapon affecting him was nearly his end, as Kess wasn't the original first choice to be traded in the cast for Seven of Nine. And he almost got Tasha Yard. Kess in this episode gets some of her most useful moments across the run of the show, having her telepathic abilities heightened by the presence of Species 8472. This was the first episode of Trek to try and dig a little deeper into who the Borg were beyond the galaxy's ultimate threat, and a bigger shade of gray than previously depicted. The Alliance does drive 8472 back into their realm, but starts Janeway as a thorn in the Queen's side for the rest of the series. At one time, this was reported as in the top 10 most streamed episodes of all time in Trek, and is a fitting start to the top 50 in this list. Mining the Mind's Minds at 49, Strategic Withdrawal, or Call to Arms. Miles, Julian, and the rest of DS9 learn that the only way to win the Battle of the Alamo is to retreat. This episode could be this high on the list purely for one small but perfectly acted scene by Max Grodenchik. As the Dominion keeps sending ships through the wormhole, Starfleet wants to stop their buildup in the Cardassian Empire, and in a brainstorming session, O'Brien, Dax, and Rom come up with this total lack of understanding of the principles of conservation of energy in self-replicating minds. But specifically, it's Rom going on about the logistics of moving in with Lita, while also coming up with the main idea for the mine. And the line delivery timing is something of perfection. He and Lita are married in a Bajoran ceremony conducted by the Cisco, 
just before the war with the Dominion kicks into high gear. Wayun comes first as an ambassador of goodwill to try and convince Sisko not to activate the minefield, and later as the bringer of destruction. Then after an amazing and well-fought space battle, they get the minefield activated and nonchalantly are able to just leave. I love that Ben comes up with a program to largely leave DS9 the way the Cardassians left it for him when they abandon it. The baseball that seemingly decides the fate of the Alpha Quadrant is the only thing of value left behind. This amazing episode leaves us with one very important question. What is a Yamak anyway? Exposing deception at 47 and 48? Four and a half lights? Or Chain of Command, parts one and two? Some might be wondering why this absolute classic isn't a bit further up in the top 50. If you go back to the very first episode of this show, I laid out some criteria for ranking, and two-parters have to stand up across the entire run of both episodes. If these were separated, part two would absolutely make the top ten for David Warner alone. However, part one has about ten minutes of actual plot to set up, padded with a good chunk of messing around in caves and Jellico just being a dick. The best moment in the first episode is right at the beginning, with Nechev's first appearance telling Riker about the change of captain and orders in her own wonderfully forceful way. The limited setup is a ploy to both capture Captain Picard and territory, and seems to be going the Cardassian's way by the end of part one. David Warner gives one of Trex and his own personal best performances in a role he only booked three days before shooting began. He had to use cue cards because of the short timing, but has some absolutely perfect line delivery that gives you an absolute feeling of dread. As he slowly breaks Picard down and builds him back up, just enough to try and extract information. Meanwhile, Jellico does some really tough negotiating, and with the help of a crew he's got constantly on edge, successfully figures out the Cardassian plan, and with the help of his previously relieved of duty Commander Riker. The other high point of this episode is Riker telling Jellico off. While he may be getting things done, he's just not someone you want to serve under. After all the talk of Riker being the ultimate shuttle pilot, we see it in action as they mine the Cardassian ships and negotiate to release Picard, and stop their deception to gain territory. I'm glad they end on a mental health piece of Picard relating to Troy that he was nearly broken, and seeing extra lights after his cycle of brainwashing. The lighting in Gull Madrid's torture chamber is some of the best in Trek, even perfectly obscuring a Picard butt shot while still leaving the room interestingly lit. The combination of two of Britain's finest Shakespearean actors is a great addition to the best the Trek franchise has to offer. Finding the limits of omnipotence at 46, dignified unaliving, or death wish. Voyager's first run-in with Q isn't even with the Q you might expect. Quinn has been imprisoned in a comet by the Continuum to keep him from hurting himself and potentially others in his quest to no longer be a mortal. And this brings up some courtroom trek as Kathy has to decide whether to grant a suicidal Q asylum. For all the times in these top 100, I cite special effects as being at their best, this episode is one of the exceptions. As many Q tricks are played throughout the episode, John Delancey's doubling himself with blue screen aura still surrounding him wasn't good, and neither is Earth that's dangled outside of Janeway's window, or most of the chase to hide in weird places to not be found. Though Voyager being hung on a Christmas tree was fun. What this episode lacks in 90s effects is well made up for in its analogy to end of life decisions and the deep thought experiment about if life is worth living after you've literally experienced everything as a higher being. This episode marks our first visit to the Q continuum, and as we see, the Q have no real need for words, they simply exist. Though the imagery used is pretty great, Quinn seems to have a point, and Janeway ends up ruling in his favor. The surprising thing is that our more familiar Q goes from prosecutor 
to Enabler by giving Quinn the poison he uses to no longer be a member of Janeway's humanoid crew. Despite bad effects and some questionable writing choices to have Q demean Kathy for being a woman captain, the overall message just resonates so hard, it earns a top spot. Seeing anthropology in action at 45, progress, or blink of an eye. The last use of a matte painting in Trek is easily its best, as this one evolves from simple civilization and religious rituals to spacefaring civilization. This is absolutely one of Trek's more unique sci-fi plots, as Voyager accidentally becomes a planet's third magnetic pole, causing the planet problems. But more interestingly, this planet exists in a different sink of time than the majority of the rest of the universe. And in a matter of hours, they witness the rise and fall of civilizations, with the Doctor spending several years on the planet as an observer, and I want to know more about his son. This plot has so many interesting little twists and turns, until the civilization attempts space travel and encounters what looks like the Voyager crew frozen in time. And then, transitioning between time frames takes a toll on your system as one of the astronauts doesn't survive. The other goes on to stop his people from destroying Voyager, and once the people on the planet knew what was really going on, advance to come up with a way to break Voyager out of orbit. It would be really neat to revisit them someday, as they probably go on to be a two or more on the Kardashev scale pretty quickly. A beautiful final use of traditional matte paintings. It's a good thing. A real good thing at 44. War. War never changes. Or the Siege of AR-558. This episode shows the up-close horrors of ground combat like no other until modern Trek, as the Defiant is on a resupply mission to the planet AR-558, which contains a captured Dominion communications relay, making it a high-value asset for the Federation to hold, and a priority target for the Dominion to reclaim. What Sisko and crew find is a broken group of Starfleet officers whose commander isn't even around anymore. And despite Jem Hadar landing during their visit, Ben decides to stay to help this ragtag group hold the line. In the process, Nog has his PTSD moment, we'll come back to a few episodes later, and they have to move invisible minds to work for instead of against them. Julian plays some music to die by that will stick with Nog, and at the end of the final battle, you think the Cisco's path may be at an end only for him to regain consciousness and find the battle won. But not without casualties. Ezri loses her new friend, played by Twilight Zone legend Bill Mummy, amongst others that lost their lives, holding. And to drive home the war, war never changes narrative, we see this war-weary group relieved by fresh cadets that you know likely won't survive this tour of duty. A hard-hitting episode that sets up some amazing episodes of DS9's final season that show us the dark side of Starfleet work we've never truly seen before. Ah, oh, computer! That program is available. Thanks, Major! Thanks, Major! Thanks, Major! Thanks, Major! Last time on Star Trek The Next Generation. Thanks, Major! USS Enterprise now under command of Captain Edward Jellicoe. Major. USS Enterprise now under command of Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Thanks, Major. And now the conclusion. Thanks, Major.